Hey everyone, I'm Matt and welcome to The Good Trouble Show. Retired Rear Admiral Tim Gallaudet will be joining us to discuss UAP, otherwise known as UFOs, in the underwater domain. I mean, who, who knew? But first, do us a solid and hit that thumbs up and subscribe button. We also love hearing your thoughts about our show today, so please leave a comment. Also, your financial support enables us to bring you this show with exceptional guests. For the, uh, uh, you can become a Patreon member for the price of a Starbucks coffee. Just go to www.patreon.com forward slash The Good Trouble Show and become a supporter. We certainly would appreciate it. And of course, Super Chats are always open and a great way to show your support. Now, today, I'm, I can't tell you, I'm so excited about this. Uh, today's guest is a retired Rear Admiral of the United States Navy, who led the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, otherwise known as NOAA. We know the government loves all those acronyms. He is a member of the Ocean Studies Board of the National Academies of Science, Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. And if that's not enough, he has been selected by the White House to join the Ocean Research Advisory Panel. Please welcome Admiral Tim uh, Gallaudet. Uh, <laughs> I know I'm going to butcher this. How are you, sir? Thank you for joining us. I'm doing great, Matt. Thanks for having me. Uh, great, fantastic. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna uh, jump right into this. As, as I said, this is a real honor having having you here uh, as, as really one of the first members of our military that's come on our show and uh, to speak about this subject. But I want to let our viewers know uh, we have you for the hour, and we're gonna do our best to get to a few listener questions. But of course, we really want to hear what you have to say. So we're just gonna kind of play it by ear. Uh, okay, so uh, I understand that. Your interest in UAP can be traced back to a famous event in 2015. So uh, tell us about that. Right. Well, I, when I was serving as an admiral in the Navy, I worked under U.S. Fleet Forces Command, and uh, my sailors were in an exercise on the ship Theodore Roosevelt, an aircraft carrier that was doing training operations in the, um, in the eastern seaboard just off the east coast. And this is well known, that this uh, Theodore Roosevelt incident of UAP, what happened is I was on uh, the receiving end of an email on the, on the Navy or DOD's secret internet. And it was from my boss, the operations officer at Fleet Forces Command, and he sent this email to all his subordinate commanders, which was about 20 one and two star admirals and their senior executive service deputies. And the title of the email was urgent safety of flight issue. And he attached the now famous leak go fast video uh, from a Navy F-18 of this UAP. And, and he asked any of us in the, in the uh, address line if we knew what that was. And he said there were multiple uh, uh, occurrences of these almost having near midair collisions with aircraft. And they were, they were thinking about shutting down the exercise uh, for, for safety reasons. And, that it was something I knew never could be produced by human technology, and uh, and that, that just convinced me that what was mostly hearsay and, and speculation and even um, subject of, of I guess stigma was real, and that's a UAP. Now, when you got this classified email and the video that was attached, what was the first thing that went through your head? Was this a complete surprise that this sort of thing came through? Well, I, I was not, but I mean, I was a bit surprised it came over official channels, but I had previously been the superintendent of the Naval Observatory, and I was in charge of a team of astrophysicists whose jobs it were, was to collect star positions, very precise star positions that are used for satellite navigation. And in learning all about the universe, basically, uh, I came to really understand that the immense scale of it physically and in time and one just has to think about that all over uh, after after so much study that uh, to think that we're alone is is really preposterous if you think you know if you give it some serious thought in terms of the the scale of the 14 billion year old universe and and so I had always thought and wondered about the phenomena and uh, and then seeing hard evidence essentially uh, convinced me. Now on this on this on this email chain. You said there, you know, there were tons of uh, SES, ad, you know, uh, one and two star admirals. Could you, can you say, uh, or maybe in a general way, 
what was the reaction to that email chain? Did other people pipe up and say, oh, yeah, we've been seeing this stuff forever? What was the general reaction to the group? No, no, this, group? this was 2015 or 16, I believe, maybe 2016. And it's amazing how much has uh, advanced in the field since then. But at that time, uh, no. What the next, I brought my SES deputy in, and he looked at it, and we both discussed it a bit, knowing what this was really breakthrough, a, a breakthrough piece of information. And uh, but the next day, on both of our computers, the email was removed, and we had no idea how it was removed, but. But having been read into classified programs, uh, special access programs, I figured that uh, this was information that touched a classified special access program and was inadvertently shared. And then, of course, whoever, the intelligence community, when they got wind that, that it was being shared on CipraNet, put, put the clamps on it. But was, what was remarkable to me is all the people on that email chain who I met with every month in person, no one ever discussed it. it. wasn't even raised at a meeting. Now, mind you, my job in the Navy, I was the oceanographer of the Navy, which acts as the chief meteorologist. And so my job was safety of flight. And because weather is one of these primary reasons for mishaps. And so knowing there were safety of flight issues, I, I was concerned and I couldn't believe that no one was talking about this afterwards. So I, I really just got to give praise to all these people who've been coming out like Dave Fravor, and, and uh, others who uh, to and Ryan Graves to just put a, to put a put a stop to the stigma. When this occurred, was there an indication as far as the, the number of these vehicles that that were floating around in the training range? No, no, it was a, it was a pretty terse email. Again, no one ever replied to it or discussed it. So back then, I only saw that one video. And I, of course, subsequently, we know from Ryan Graves. That they, these are they were all over the place, and there were multiple potential near 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 midair collisions occurring, and and so this isn't just a one off. Uh, obviously, we know this now from people coming forward, whistleblowers like David Grush, and others. And was it? I'm trying to think how to ask this. So at the time, so there was a, still a considerable amount of stigma. But with all of this fouling these 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 training ranges. Was there any further talk uh, amongst your your colleagues about the seriousness of this? And of course, we didn't. No one wants anything to happen to any of our of our aviators. I mean, that's a pretty serious thing if these are flying around with impunity. Exactly. I mean, this is what we have. We have two potential scenarios. We have either a threat to national security from an adversary, or off-world exotic technology, which demands study because the the potential discovery of these technology or physics advances could change us for the better. And so no one talking about this really was dis disturbing to me. But of course, I knew I'd been read into special access programs, so I knew my options as a government employee were really none. That I, I you, when you are read into those, you're, you're bound not to disclose the information, et, et cetera. And it's why it, what gets people thrown into jail, you know? So that was something I had to take seriously. And I sat on it. And once the videos were released and people like Ryan Graves would come forward, I figured, heck, you know, I am a retired admiral. My voice ends a bit, lends a bit of credibility to the topic. And, and I want to go to bat for people like him because this is really could be a change in our understanding that that ri doesn't even rival, outpaces the, the scientific revolution of the 16th and 17th century by orders of magnitude. So we should be looking at this. Is there any possibility that that what you saw, at least in the in the films, that these could have been balloons or or drones? Although this was what I think like 2015, so I, I don't even think commercial drones were really available back then. Is there any possibility it could have been mistaken for a prosaic explanation? I think no. Uh, the video on its own could be, you know, it, it easily could have been uh, artificially created. However, this was a video that I know for a fact was taken off a Navy F-18, and it was dis distributed by the operations officer at U.S. Fleet Forces Command to all his subordinate commanders. So there was no question about the authenticity of it. And the fact that multiple pilots observed these phenomena and did not know what they were, and they exhibited characteristics that no other types of aircraft exhibited. And these are professional observers, these aviators. They know what they're doing. It's their job to assess uh, uh, 
threats in, in, in the air. And so uh, that together put it as really, there could be no other explanation. And, and folks, again, keep in mind here, we are listening to a retired Navy rear admiral. This isn't just uh, someone off the, the street or a, a UFO person. This guy served our country and the, the gravitas of that coming from some, someone like you, sir, we, we really appreciate that. And so, because you, you hear, you'll hear like the debunkers say, well, uh, these F-18 uh, Hornet drivers were misreading sensor anomalies or uh, it was some kind of misrepresentation. I, I can't, it's hard for me to believe someone that we, or, or, or men and women in uniform that we invest tens of millions of dollars in driving our most expensive military hardware would make that, would make that mistake. It's, this chances are really slim, right? These guys, this is what they do, these men and women. Right, Matt. I mean, the chances I would think are zero. And the people who have come forward, they don't have anything to gain by this. In fact, you th look at Matt Graves, who was a professional naval aviator. He has much to lose. He's not built up a career like I have, and I'm receiving my military retirement pay. He's showing quite a bit of courage, but he and his he's established the Americans for Safe Aerospace nonprofit uh, with the goal of advancing the scientific study of these phenomena, which I think is very commendable for the reasons I mentioned. That we're either going to get down to what is a national security threat or learn about something that could just change our understanding uh, for the better. I think one, one thing to keep in mind uh, with, uh, because people will say, obviously, there have been instances of, of foreign adversaries floating in, uh, intelligence rec reconnaissance surveillance platforms around in our airspace. We saw this with, with the Chinese balloon. But I think one thing that people should keep in mind is these vehicles, a description of these vehicles, these things have been occurring predating World War II. So this isn't something new that, that you, could, you can just absolutely attribute to a, a, prosaic, uh, a prosaic explanation. Now, now going back to, to, you were talking about your, your experience in, 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 in your line of work of having access to special access programs and whatnot, a common argument that you will hear, and this is really in relation to the recent allegations by whistleblower David Grush, a lot of people will say, you know, there's no way that the government could keep a, a program like that hidden from the public for such a period of time that, that the mechanisms of government are such that it's inefficient and it would leak at some point. What would you say to that? Huh. I would say they've not worked in the government because I have <laughs> been read in special access programs and I, I know exactly how that is, how there is there's a limited number of people that are allowed to have the access for any given program. And the people who manage it, these SAP control, special access program control officers, they're very serious, they're dedicated patriots. But, but, the, but the issue is that uh, they, they can become so restrictive that people with authority and a need to know can be deemed by people with much less authority in those programs as not having a need to know. And I'll refer to something here that your audience can go look at, but there's this thing about called the Wilson Memo. And this is exactly what's being addressed by that, that incident, is a senior flag officer like me who was trying to understand more about these programs and the control, the, the people who were read into them, the career bureaucrats, wouldn't, would not allow access, and they were keeping a tight hold on it. And, I, and it kills me because it, people in authority, like Congress, do need to know. And so for pe bureaucrats in the government to be restrictive like that is damaging and wrong. And that's why David's come forward and the others I mentioned. I, and I applaud them and I want to support them. I, I couldn't agree more. Ab absolutely. And the folks that I, that I speak with in Congress, they feel, of course, the exact same way. It's, it's, uh, it, I, it blows my mind that, that this sort of stuff is going on and being hidden from our lawmakers, in my view, illegally. Now, so this is obviously a, 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 something that was of interest to you, the whole UAP phenomenon. Other admirals after this particular event, and even not really specifically talking about what, what you witnessed on the Cipronet, did you find over, towards the rest of your naval career that there was more open communication among naval leadership or your colleagues 
in bringing this stuff up at the dinner table or, or at, a, at a bar or whatever? Or was there so much stigma that it really wasn't discussed? Exactly. It wasn't at all. Nobody discussed it. And I, I, was, I was surprised. I thought about that probably every day. And the, I mean, the only person I talked to was my senior executive service deputy a few times about it because uh, we had a great relationship. We were very open. But in other circles, never discussed at all. And of course, so I got, bid my time. I retired. I did four more years in the government at, at NOAA uh, and uh, just kind of watched the, the conversation start evolving very rapidly of late. And that's when I decided to chip in. So over, over the years, there have been the controversial claims you may have heard of surrounding clandestine meetings with other flag officers regarding an ongoing campaign to study this phenomenon in secret. Can you help the rest of this uh, rest of us sort of understand, like, what would be the risks uh, a senior ranking officer would hypothetically face if they went out of their lane looking into this, at least from the, you know, in the Navy? Well, yes, it, I, there are risks, of course, because you're authorized, any given officer who has authority over a program or a command or a unit has certain authorities and, and, and he can be, or she can be, again read into certain programs and that's that's where your your span of control and is is appropriate and you're allowed to pursue i knew i knew my mission my mission was weather and oceanography and hydrography and i was read into certain programs that were related to environmental intelligence and and so that I, that's where that's that's the lane or swim lane I, I went down and everyone else intelligence community or aviation you name it navy seals they, they do what they're allowed to do and their mission is prescribed to be, be and do. And so, again, if, if, you were to, if you were to start poking holes and looking around uh, things outside of your, your peer view was, uh, you, you, it's, it, it's grounds for being fired, essentially, terminated. That's, that's, that, that, now, granted, no, people weren't pursuing or avoiding this because they didn't want to get fired. It's just what good officers learn how to do. I never pursued programs or things that I knew weren't uh, in my my lane. I mean, there was a lot of really interesting stuff out there in the Pentagon, but uh, I knew what my charge was from my boss. So I wouldn't say it was necessarily a threat of punitive action, even though that ultimately would be what it, what it would be. Uh, it's that any officer is given a certain scope of authority, and they and they manage and work with that. And so when these programs were so compartmented that even senior naval officers or, or military officers weren't allowed in. Um, that, that that created a, a problem, and and it just took, I guess, well, I know what it took. I'm working with Chris Mellon, for example, uh, well-known uh, um, individual in these spaces, and and he, when he was working in, in as uh, a senior defense intelligence official, he, he learned about this, and he ultimately got the Congress involved, and that's what it took to really break free this information. So again, a guy showing great amount of courage and changing the whole discussion and creating the inflection point that we're on today. And I, so I'm really I'm proud to be, uh, have, have written with him so if you are an article and, uh, and work with him on the Harvard University Galileo project. I, I think that's fantastic. I, now I, I have to ask, what is the, the, the photo right behind you? Is, is, uh, what, what ship is that uh, over your left shoulder? That's, that's the USS Kitty Hawk. It's an aircraft carrier that I served on for uh, nearly three years home ported in Japan. And um, we actually had a, just really briefly, a very uh, a pretty impressive run. We conducted the first strikes into Afghanistan after 9-11 with special operations forces, not the normal air wing, Navy carrier air wing. And then we did the same thing uh, for the Iraq war in 2003. So I was, I was on that ship quite a bit during those two and a half years. That's that's fantastic. Okay, so speaking of carriers, have have you heard if these craft are still interacting with our carrier strike groups? Uh, I have not, uh, but I'm not I'm not privy to operational information right now, and certainly not classified information. So I wouldn't know if it was occurring. I just don't don't have the access right now. Uh, maybe maybe not. I know, but I, this is what Congress is getting after with the Aero Office, the ARO. And, um, and of course, they've held unclassified hearings as well as classified hearings. And I just don't see that office really disclosing a whole lot because I believe the information that's of value to us that they find 
will probably be classified because the technology might be so advanced they don't want our adversaries uh, getting any wind of it. So that, that I applaud what uh, Senator Gillibrand has done to establish that office, but the nature of the Pentagon and classification system is going to be a tough thing to work around to enable full disclosure that the, so much of the public are, are calling for. So someone like yourself that has spent their entire career in national security, what is your feeling as far as what the public should be told? Obviously, it, it seems that there are things that, that we shouldn't be told, but do you think the, uh, the government or Pentagon or who, whatever, whoever it would come from, going before the American public, maybe even the president, and saying we are being interacted with by non-human intelligence, where do you think the classification line is drawn? Do you think, what do you think the American public should know about this? this? And of course, we're speaking theoretically to, you know, to a great extent. Well, if this is, Matt, uh, evidence of non-human intelligence, I, I believe the public deserves to know, because this is something all nations have to grapple with. Uh, it, it, are they? Fr there's a lot, there's some questions here. Are they friendly or not? Uh, why are they interacting? What, what is their purpose? This, these are important issues right now, especially given the how. How are they doing it? This is technology we do not possess, and so there's many potential advantages to be gained by learning more and, and potential risks. And ultimately, I, I do believe the public should know now uh, more about this. And certainly if it's something that all nations are facing equally, this isn't us trying to gain advantage over China, in my opinion. It is about us as a civilization understanding the new nature of reality that is being thrown upon us. Now, only a few, only a few years ago, I found out that these things operate well like when I when I always thought of UFOs I always thought of these things flying between space and in our atmosphere I I had never heard until just a few years ago that these things apparently operate in uh, you know in our seas under, underwater so how common are these reports and and how fast have you heard these vehicles being clocked operating underwater Right. Well, the, the trouble with ocean observations of anomalous phenomena are that it's much harder to find and see things in the ocean. We primarily rely on sonar. Uh, optical wavelengths cannot tra transmit very far in the, in the water. And, and so because of that, and because of the fact that we've not even mapped, uh, uh, boy, we've not explored even 10% of the ocean volume, and we've, we've mapped less than half in our own exclusive economic zone. So we know very little about the ocean as it is. Uh, but with these phenomena now, uh, and, and it, it's even more difficult to get our arms around it. Uh, but uh, what I, because of my ocean expertise and because we know from observations in the air that these phenomena tra have, trans have transferred through the boundary uh, and there are observations uh, uh, anecdotally of these phenomena in, under under sea, uh, I, it, I've taken it on to use the nation's ocean science and research capacity to uncover more if we can uh, scientifically about the phenomena. Now, with the with aerial phenomena, you you hear about these incredible maneuvers, instantaneous acceleration. Uh, change of direction instantly without a without a big arc. Have you heard of UAP? And, and I understand that there's there's actually an acronym for these things operating under the water. U, is it USO or, or what is uh, what is the acronym for that? Right. I think the community has been calling these unidentified submerged objects for some time. And uh, but now that the Pentagon, uh, with Congress's direction, has labeled all these phenomena as unidentified anomalous phenomena and their charge in the aero office is all domain i think kind of that's leveled the playing field if you will and and sort of try to unify the discussion and i think it's great and i actually had a discussion with sean kirkpatrick the director and a few of his teammates uh, volunteering to lend my oceanography expertise to the office and, and this is interesting to me because the response i got was great tim love would love that but we have limited funding as it is, so we're just going to focus on those that we have seen the most of, and that is unidentified uh, or UAPs in the air, in the atmosphere. And so I, I, I kind of went on hold for a bit, but now I understand Jill Brand is, is calling in the next uh, 
next defense budget for full funding of the office. So that just might change. I hope I hope it does. Yes, she has. We we have the senator on our show, Senator Jill Brand, and and I tell you what, boy, I mean, she is really a force to be reckoned with, and the the nation owes her a or owes a great deal of a, a great deal a debt of honor to her. I'm trying to say uh, for for breaking this 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 stigma. So um, so have these things been observed making right angle turns or? the same type of behavior? Because one of the things that I've heard is that there's no cavitation with these objects, that they're able to, to move from the air into water without a splash. What have you heard in terms of the anom anomalous behavior of these things? Well, Matt, it's exactly as what you said. These uh, exhibiting, uh, uh, anecdotally, exhibiting characteristics that our types of vessels and under submarines and and craft just don't do. Like you said, entering the water without a splash, uh, high speeds that uh, our, our undersea vehicles are unable to achieve as we know it. And so there, there's a range of these anecdotally, but I've not, I'm not seeing any data. And so what, what uh, Avi Loeb at the, at the Galileo project, his goal is to look at the aerial uh, phenomena and scientifically study them. And I think that's a really laudable goal and I, I believe a, a nice complement to that would be something similar in our oceans. And uh, now, granted, I mean, we, it'll be harder to find things in the ocean, but we have immense data collection capabilities. And, uh, and like NASA is doing, you know, NASA is convening a study team to look at UAP. And uh, on that team is a, a, a very highly regarded oceanographer named Dr. Paula Bontempi, who I know, I know well. And so I, I proposed, in fact, as you mentioned in the, early, in, the, in the broadcast here, I'm a member of the Ocean Studies Board at the National Academies, and they're, the, they're the really the highest ranking body, if you will, to uh, conduct studies on, our, on ocean topics. And I proposed to them just this year to do a survey of all ocean collection uh, institutions, being labs, universities, and government agencies, to survey their data and look for an uh, catalog anomalous phenomena. Uh, and just so we get a baseline of what's out there maybe in the data. Because now if someone sees something like that, it's not expected. So they basically filter it out and call it noise or, or an outlier. And I think, I think if we were to look under the hood of a lot of our data holdings, we might see things that uh, defy explanation. And with that as a baseline, then we can design a more proper survey like the Galileo project is conducting by putting uh, putting putting sensor suites in different locations to do systematic observational studies. So I'm working to go in that direction. When I briefed the Ocean Studies Board, and this was this was just after the NASA team was announced, so I felt I had enough to stand on. Mm -hmm. and, and and interestingly, they did not uh, laugh me out of the room. In fact, they were serious and said, "This is this is very interesting. We think we should look at this." But to do a proper study, you should include the, the, the sources of classified information, like the Navy. And so they recommended me go to another National Academies body, and that's the Naval Studies Board. And I did. I went to the Naval Studies Board. The chair of that board is Admiral Gary Roughhead, former Chief of Naval Operations, four-star Admiral, my former boss, who I know and have briefed before on different topics. And when I went to him, he would, again, I was impressed. He thought this did deserve study. Great. And he would, he would, he would sanction such a study. And he, he said it would do, a, fulfill an important purpose, two of them actually, to again, learn more about UAP under the oceans, uh, or, and gain more information about where our gaps in environmental knowledge are in the oceans. Because right now, China and Russia are outpacing us in their abilities in undersea warfare, or they're coming close to it, put it that way. And a, a real a real key part, the enabler is our knowledge of oceanography and hydrography and all the things I did. And so he thought that would be important for us to get a good baseline on that, our gaps in knowledge there too. So anyways, I have that go ahead. Now the last thing I need is money. I need a government agency to sponsor the study. All the studies under these boards have to have a government sponsor. So. I'm, I'm working to do a little homework and find some more information and about, about occurrences of these phenomena. And then I intend to go to 
the DOD's arrow, the Office of Naval Intelligence, who I know the director, as well as the Naval Oceanographic Office, uh, who I also know their, their commanding officer, and see if together they might fund a survey to look at uh, undersea data sets for, uh, and identify any instances of anomalous phenomena. It was interesting, in the UAP hearing that occurred in the House, I think it was about two years ago, I forget the congressman that asked, uh, the, um, oh, who was it? Uh, it? I believe it might have been the gentleman from the Navy, but but I think it was Ronald Moultrie that, that responded. And the question was, that, that was put by one of the congressmen was, have these things been observed in the ocean? I think that was the exact question. And Ronald Moultrie said that would be best discussed in the closed session, sir, I think was, was the reply. If you were to guess, would you say that that reply was mainly related, because, related to the fact that they would have to discuss sensor systems in ISR platforms? Any idea why they, he would have just said, yeah, we're seeing this stuff going in, in and out of the water. Just, I thought that was just odd the way that he answered that. It's exactly as you said, Matt, that anything collected by a Navy submarine, for example, or our acoustic surveillance network, uh, that, that, data, that data is classified. That will never, never be disclosed to the public, I believe, not for a long time, because th those systems allow us to observe the capabilities of our adversaries, China and Russia especially, at the top of the list, and who are very, very capable in their undersea warfare uh, capabilities and capacity. And so that that just that data will not be shared with the public. It would just it would just show our hand too much to uh, our our competitors. I'm completely understood. So it sounds like very much in the same way of, of what Dr. Loeb is doing, deploying deploying his own can't talk deploying his own sensor suites. So we're not he's not relying on data that he might be able to get from the government, but could never speak about it or publish it due to the classification level. So this, the same sort of approach essentially would have to happen looking at underwater phenomenon, correct? Exactly, yes. And that's a trickier one too, by the way, because let's say I am a university and I want to put acoustic sensors in the water and that happens to be near or uh, co-located with a Navy submarine training range, well, then we start, that means that those sensors will be collecting signatures of those submarines, which auto, uh, which automatically become classified for, for very good reason. Uh, we do not want our adversaries to know those signatures. And so that's, that's going to be a trickier thing to look at the nation's oceans. However, networks do exist, and, uh, and there's, there's a way to do that if we just make sure we don't we de-conflict with the Navy. That totally makes sense. Now, if this phenomenon is realized to be NHI, non-human intelligence, at an advanced technological level, in, in your experience, what are the sort of pragmatic responses that we might expect from leadership regarding defense and diplomacy efforts? Would we be starting from scratch, essentially? I think we, well, no, well, I wouldn't say we were starting from scratch because I, as is coming out, there is, a, there are elements in the government that know about these, right? David Grush came out. Right. So to some He's not degree, the only one. No, and you have, of course, you have the Aero office whose goal right now is to observe these and characterize them scientifically. So at many levels, people are beginning to think about this more. Uh, I don't think enough people are, and certainly not at the highest levels. I mean, of course, the Secretary of Defense has his hands full right now in a lot of places. And so, uh, but when you think about the magnitude of this discovery and the fact that, uh, you know, actually, I think about this often now, that uh, here we are quibbling over China and Russia uh, as, as competitors, when the magnitude of this discovery could dwarf that by orders of magnitude. Especially when we think about uh, the the fact that we don't know their intent, or or at least, at least many in the government do not, I believe. And I think as we, much as we study our adversaries uh, within our own species, we might want to be get a better understanding of this uh, when you think about the consequences and implications. It's it boggles my mind that we are spending so much time and energy on on. on our little conflicts when 
something so much greater is right on our doorstep. If you were to take a stab at it, let's say that that the reverse engineer crash reverse engineering crash programs are indeed true, and that it has been hidden from Congress and the and Americans. If if you were to venture to guess, why do you think there is the continued secrecy? Well, first, Matt, is, as you said before, it's the special access program bureaucracy. That, that, that's a very institutionalized en el element of, of the DOD and the intelligence community. And so that, that, that does not surprise me that we're at this point. I've seen it in action. I know how it is. And, uh, and I, I, I was insulted sometimes. When I, was, uh, I was not allowed to be read into programs uh, as a flag officer for that, that, that kind of phenomena, basically. Um, and so uh, you could call that anomalous phenomena. How about that? Wow, but, yeah. Um, so, so there's that. Also, let's just keep in mind here about Dave Bruce coming out. I know enough about his, his, his community, the intelligence community in the DOD, to find him to be 100% believable. People have come to him. He, you know, he's not seen the material, et cetera, but he's had credible conversations. And I, I am not surprised in the slightest that this is happening right now. So I, I'm convinced that we are at an inflection point on our knowledge of our place in the universe. And there is going to be much more disclosed very soon. And we ought to prepare ourselves for this. I totally agree. This this is a conversation that, that I am convinced is going to be front and center. And sources, multiple sources have told me that, that David Grush is the tip of the iceberg. Many more are coming forward, people involved in the program, because they understand that, that the secrecy and what has gone on is frankly un-American and, and it's time to level with the American, American public. So if, what would be the one question you think people should be asking that they, uh, that they aren't? Well, there's not one, Matt. There's many. This, this <laughs> there are lots. Amazing. I mean, the questions I have is, first of all, why? Why are these objects, these entities, whatever, uh, why, why their interaction with us? Uh, why not more? Why is it at all? Uh, there's just so many whys on what, what, uh, uh, the nature of this phenomena. The how is just as compelling. How are they doing it? How are the, like, you look at what Ryan has seen or the Tic Tac from David Fravor and Alex Dietrich. What, like, how, did, how is that occurring? These things that have no means of propulsion, they have no control surfaces. How, like, how is this occurring? I'm excited about that, by the way. I, there's, there are either new physics or new technologies or both. And when I say new physics, physics we've not yet discovered. So think about this. I, I'm astonished that more people don't adopt the the kind of the mindset of Avi Loeb at Galileo Project at Harvard. He thinks about the universe in these broad terms, and that the time frame that human beings have been on in existence on this planet is so infinitesimal compared to the scale of the universe. And that's why he has he has theorized that potentially some of the objects that he's observed could be relics of ancient civilizations who've evolved and, and declined uh, long ago. And so that just seems absolutely probable to me. And, and then, so there, there's, there's things like that that I think are just really important that we want to understand and learn and, and, and for that will, could potentially benefit uh, or at least uh, reduce the risk to mankind. So, so if, I were to, if I were to sum it, sum it up, so, so, Admiral, as a, a career officer in the United States Navy, a rear admiral that spent his career protecting this nation, in your opinion, it sounds as if you believe that this is indeed a non-human intelligence. Is that, would that be a fair, uh, am I characterizing that pretty well? Or, or do you, you kind of, what, what you, if you were to summarize it, what would you say is your best uh, guess in your experience? I think, uh, well, you could say we're not alone. People use that phrase, but and, and that should that should wake everybody up. This is amazing to me, but I think it's very probable. Why, why would we be so, um, I would say, uh, um, conceited to think that we are the top uh, most intelligent 
thing in the cosmic block, as Avi would say. Uh, the smartest kid on the cosmic block, as the term he likes to say. And, it's, and he's right. He's absolutely right. And, and that, that should, one, uh, cause us to be a little bit humble and, and show some humility. Uh, but also, our curiosity should be spiking right now. Who are they? What are they? Uh, what is their intent? And, and ultimately, going back to your reference to me as a career naval officer, uh, Matt, I, I, I think I spent my career serving our country, defending it and its interests and values. And like you said, hiding this information from the American public is un-American. It is, it is counter to our values. I think the public is savvy enough to know surveys have been conducted, that many people do think that there, there are other intelligences possibly in the universe, maybe right here, again, on our doorstep. Uh, and we should make that information available to the American people. Hey, Amen. I- couldn't dis- I couldn't agree with you more. It's, and I think this, this sort of argument you've heard over the years that society is going to melt down, blah, blah, blah. I, I honestly don't think it is going to be a surprise to anyone. And, you know, the other thing to consider as well is continuing to hide this, hide, the government or, or non-government or career bureaucrats continuing to hide this, the, the long-term damage it does to the pillars of our democracy by running this illegal program and, and hiding it, the longer it sits in the refrigerator rotting, it's not going to get any better, I think, as Lou Elizondo has, uh, has stated. Uh, so I'd love to get so, to some listener questions, if you don't mind. There's some really great, uh, great questions here. I can make one, Please. one more comment. So I think Avi Loeb at Harvard's naming the Galileo Project as it is, is, is very representative of where we are where Galileo uh, observed the heavens and realized we have a heliocentric solar system and the, the authorities at the time refused to believe it. And think how much we benefited by having an accurate understanding of the universe and reality as it is as we built our scientific knowledge base. The same applies here. We have only to gain if we open this knowledge to all and uh, allow more study, scientific study of it. Agreed. And the other thing as well, as, as we mentioned, there is a serious, in my view, a, a national security element of this whole thing. You have to ask yourself, these, these objects demonstrate signature management. They oftentimes see, seem not to want to be observed. And you have to ask yourself, well, what is the intent of that from just a national security point of view? And, and it just, yeah, it blows me away that more people aren't engaged in this. The you know, we have the upcoming hearing, hopefully with with on the Senate. I'm sorry, the House Oversight Committee with Tim Burchett. Hopefully, David Grush will be part of that. I'm sure he will, and certainly I hope other other whistleblowers. It's this is something again. It's going to be front and center. It doesn't matter if you're Republican, Democrat, whatever. All of us have to come together as a country and have a honest discussion about this. So. That being said, let's uh, let's get to a few questions if you don't mind. And again, thank you, thank you for your time. Um, oops, let's see here. Uh, first, uh, thank you for uh, super chats from some folks. Uh, Tony D, is the admiral allowed to speak about the USOs that travel at very high speed underwater? Good question. Uh, I am not allowed to disclose classified information, and I'll be honest, I've not seen any data or information on USOs when I was in the military and held a clearance. Uh, I left the military in 2017, and now I've been interviewing people who have made, who've come out to make certain reports confidentially to me. So I, uh, and that, that also I'm, uh, I'm trusting, uh, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to share their information or names yet. Uh, I'm building that knowledge base to again, go to the different government agencies I mentioned to get funding for a more systematic study. Uh, so. Uh, for the, the knowledge I do have, I, I'm not going to share it, uh, just to keep the trust of those who've come to me, but at the same, in the same time, I've not seen personally any information on classified systems, but this is what we want to see disclosed uh, as we go forward. As, as someone that's, that spent their life in national security, do you think the hesitancy on the, on the DOD's level writ large could it be that they don't want to admit that this is something we do not have 
control over uh, or any sort of countermeasures. Right. Well, yes, man. That, that actually has been a long standing, uh, I'd say, unofficial policy to not, not admit what we uh, really don't have a defense against. And that, 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 and it really, it's really, the, I guess, the base of it is to not disclose capabilities, uh, whether we, we have knowledge of them or not. For example, the, the Chinese spy balloon, we didn't really have a good understanding of that. And, um, and therefore, the military re was hesitant to release information until what the amateur photographer in Montana, whoever. So that, that's kind of, and that's just the nature of the DOD. And you can hear all this discussion about it that uh, the tendency to overclassify information. And it, that, that is potentially damaging. And I think we, we need to be more judicious about that. Excellent. Uh, let's see here. Does the Admiral know if any near misses collision, or if know of any near misses or collision with USOs? Are they friend or foe? Well, uh, again, anecdotally, I've heard of one, and uh, um, but and then there may be many more. Uh, but no, no, no interactions that I've, no collisions that I know of yet. But what's interesting about that, when you look at the aerial or atmospheric ca counterpart to USOs. Uh, the pilots who I've, you've seen interviewed have uh, had to evade when they were seeing these objects in certain situations. And, uh, and, and this is many multiple pilots. So it's very interesting. And to think that that might be occurring under sea, well, I know it has on at least one occasion. Uh, yeah, d just demands further scientific study. So I just want to uh, nail you down on this. So you're saying that you are aware of one instance of a USO having a collision or near c collision with one of our naval assets? Actually, two, yes. Also, and that is, again, an anecdote from an observer. I'm not seeing data, but I, I deem them to be both uh, credible witnesses. Got it. Okay. Um, has, is NOAA, uh, National, uh, uh, what is the acronym, National Oceanic, uh, you, you'll have to fill it out for me. Okay, I'll, I'll get my acronym straight one of these days. Is NOAA ever contacted about all anomalous activities in land, air, and sea? Well, let's see, that does occur. Uh, I've, the National Weather Service is under NOAA, and I do know, again, anecdotally of them receiving reports but they receive reports from everything. I mean, monarch butterflies create weather radar signatures, and that gets reported wow. to the weather service. So this, it's a, they receive all sorts of things, and I, I don't think they've even begun to catalog anomalous phenomena yet. I know they haven't, in fact, because I was in charge of NOAA for three and a half years. But, uh, but then, again, like we're seeing with the DOD, they can be a source of data for us. And in fact, I know of one instance, again, I'm not going to reveal the person's name, of a very credible science scientist who had a, a data from a NASA mission. Now, NASA funded them to do at atmospheric observations uh, and, uh, and the aircraft that was taking the atmospheric observations over the pole, or the North Pole, had, had an encounter with a UAP that had no other explanation because there were no aircraft, that on, there were no aircraft routes, routes in this area and the, it was it was dusk, and the object was emitting light, and they, and he he and in fact I was surprised by this uh, when him sharing it with me, because um, I I just have a good relationship with some of the scientists there, and and when I shared with him what I was doing, I, I did it in a bit of a joke, and I said you might think I'm I'm off my rocker, but here's <laughs> what I'm pursuing, and he sent me a reply that was totally straight up and said I do not think you're off your rocker. I had this video, and he would have shared it with me. Uh, it was video from the cockpit, but his house burned down in a fire in Colorado, oh, and he man. lost the video. Yeah, yeah, wow. exactly. So th there, this is starting to happen, where real credible witnesses are coming in and saying things with authority that uh, I, I have I've observed these as well. I, it's funny, too. It's like when I bring this up to people just kind of out of the blue, I have found more often than not, someone will say, well, you know, actually when I was a kid, I saw this. It's, it's sort of surprising that there are more people that have encountered this than, than I 
than I have certainly ever knew. I just think it's part of that stigma sort of, uh, sort of breaking down. Uh, Tony D has a question. Uh, does the Admiral know where the USOs are coming from going to? Do you think it's possible they have underwater bases or, or it's just that's, I mean, I have no idea, but any, any thoughts on that? Right, I've seen the television shows that, on this topic and right now we have no evidence we have no data i i don't know uh, that's a question you asked me what's the big question people should be asking that's one of them where are they coming from I, we, we we should be looking into this it's incredible and so yes i, I don't know i can't answer that question because i don't have the data but we should be working on collecting data i will tell you when i was at NOAA, we launched an initiative to map our exclusive economic zone we have still only mapped about 50 percent of it so we've not even surveyed the ocean floor in our own backyard. We, we know the surface of Mars and the moon to a higher resolution than we do our own ocean floor. So if for anything, uh, if for the national security and economic reasons of mapping the ocean, this is another reason. That, that totally makes sense. That, it's, it, you know, the thing that, again, just it blows me away is why there is not more interest in, the, interest in this. And uh, we actually have a, a question here from D. Stu. Uh, what does the Admiral think of the media not putting this on the front pages? It blows my mind why this is not on the front page of the New York Times, Washington Post, everywhere. It, it, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I can't believe it either. It's cra they're, they're looking at all these little domestic issues, and some are significant. Others really are trivial, but they get headlines. And, and this is the story of the century, without question. With, without question, uh, without question, uh, for sure. Uh, we got a couple super chats uh, from Shack Valet. Thank you so much. Uh, this is from uh, Michael uh, Padilla. Uh, pardon me. Is that Jacques Valet? Uh, no. no. Uh, uh, but maybe who knows? Uh, so Michael Padilla uh, says, "I served on uh, the Diego Garcia with the Seabees." Did you, sir, ever see anything relating to the phenomenon during an Indian Ocean cruise? I have sailed through the Indian Ocean, and I, and I have not seen anything. Love to know if that if that listener would like to contact me. Happy to, and he's seen or she, he or she's seen something. I would really be interested in interviewing them. Excellent. And and speaking of which, how how can folks find you and support what you're doing? We'll, and we'll make sure we have the information in the video description. Sure. You, you can go onto my LinkedIn site, Admiral Tim Gallaudet, uh, and you my contact information is there. I, I welcome you all reaching out to me. Excellent. That's fantastic. Uh, Johnny, Johnny Horrible, I guess like Johnny Rotten. Uh, would there be a priority to shoot a to shoot UAP down? Would there be priority to shoot a UAP down to study it, if that would be the, the purpose of doing it? Any, any thoughts on that? Well, I can't speak for the Department of Defense right now. Certainly threats to our airspace uh, might warrant that kind, of, uh, that kind of response. We didn't, well, we did that to the balloon only after it was over, a Chinese balloon over, over, uh, over the ocean. And then those are decisions that are complicated. I'll just say that. Uh, but I, I, I sure hope we don't do that to anything that we don't understand. I, yeah, I totally agree. And folks, by the way, contact your lawmakers. Ask them about the Alaska shoot down. There is something to that, and I guarantee you it's not prosaic. Uh, okay, moving on. Uh, from uh, Tommy, does the Admiral know of anyone else that has had similar effects like Ryan Graves type thing? I'm not sure if he's meaning physical effects. I'm not real sure. It's from Lisa. Um, I, yeah, I'm not well, sure. I knew that Ryan and David had squadron mates who also observed the phenomena and, and more are coming forward. So there, these aren't, these aren't again, as I mentioned, one off observe observations that they're, they, these are the first people to take the courage, to show the courage to, to speak up. And they're, they're, they're uh, in front of many who are starting to come forward. Niles Guy, this is a really great question. Have there been any examples of hostility that you've heard from these vehicles? Well, uh, no, I have not. But if you look at the literature, there are examples. In the literature, I mean things like, um, gosh, uh, 
there's a two book series uh, that is uh, regarding Skinwalker Ranch that details some uh, some malevolent activity. Which uh, now I'm not going to speak for the credibility of that book, but it's very compelling. Those two books, and uh, yeah, just that's just something to think about. And we need to we need to look learn more about that as well. Hmm. Yeah, that, I love that book. I've uh, read it a couple of times. Actually, the first time the first time I got it, I swear I read it in like four hours. I couldn't couldn't put the I couldn't put the thing down at all. Um, have there been? This is another really great uh, great question from Niles Guy. Have there been any communications or signals from UAP? Uh, and I think I think he means maybe not necessarily uh, signals or signature from propulsion, but intentional efforts of communication from UAP with our military. Right. I, I don't know that, and that's something we should be looking into. And if we have data on that, that's something I believe should be declassified and shared with the public being communicated with by a non-human intelligence. This is, this is how many Hollywood movies have been <laughs> beginning right. with, with uh, E.T. and uh, really close encounters before that. This is something the public wants to know and we should know and society should open up to and again with potential benefits and avoiding risks that are just so much greater than anything we face so far. Excellent. I, I, Admiral, I can't thank you enough for joining us. Your, your insight into this particular topic. And again, folks, we're listening to a rear admiral, a rear admiral retired from the United States Navy. This is a gentleman that has served our country and knows a thing, a thing or two about what's going on in our oceans. Um, so, Admiral, thank you very much for joining us, and we look forward. Uh, hopefully, have you back on again and, and hear of your uh, your your developments. I, we are really excited about this. So, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for having me, Matt. It's been a lot of fun. Awesome. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Uh, for our for our Patreon members, we're going to have a. Uh, ask me anything session here pretty soon probably this weekend so we'll post something up on this again if you enjoyed our show we always appreciate you sharing uh, telling your friends about us likes you know thumbs up all that good stuff that really helps the the twitter algorithm and the uh, youtube algorithm uh, promote our show organically anyway thanks for joining us admiral and we will see you soon thank you very much